Hi, I'm John DeLynn, and uh, I'm the host of Mormon Stories Podcast, and welcome to Gospel Tangents. The source for Mormon history, science, and theology, I'm Rick Bennett. I am really excited I got the biggest fish in Mormon podcasting on the show, Dr. John DeLynn from the Mormon Stories Podcast. Yes, you got it. So we're going to talk a lot about his life, um, dating an Oscar-winning actress in high school. What was that like? We'll also talk about uh, Mormon stories, how it's changed over the years, his interactions with Daniel Peterson and Elder Jeffrey Holland. And so it's going to be a, a fantastic conversation. You definitely won't want to miss this one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I am both your host and the guest for today's episode. And here's what I mean by that. Today we have in studio the man, the myth, the legend, Rick Bennett. Hey, Rick. Hey, John. How you doing? Good. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rick, Rick is the host of a really important podcast slash YouTube channel called Gospel Tangents. And uh, for several years now, Rick has been interviewing uh, what I would say mostly is members of the Mormon studies kind of scholarship community. He's interviewed Richard Bushman. He's interviewed Matt Harris, uh, Shannon Flynn, lots of cool people. It's a great library, a really important asset uh, for those who are in the know. Even yesterday in my interview with Tom Thomas Murphy, he mentions how important uh, Rick Bennett's stuff. Stephen Peiniger really loves uh, uh, Rick Bennett. Steve he mentioned is definitely him. a fanboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're, a we're both mutual fans of Stephen. So anyway, um, I've also known Rick for many years, kind of on the blogger knuckle, and he does great work. So, um, so, Rick's wanted to interview, interview me for a little bit. We tried an interview a few months ago, several months ago. And uh, when when it was done, it was during a really stressful time where we were getting a lot of attacks. And uh, after Gerardo reviewed it, Gerardo said, I don't think we should release this. So it's one of those bootleg uh, unreleased interviews uh, that now if I went back and watched it, maybe I wouldn't care. But anyway, Rick's back. He's willing to go one more time and try and interview me. And so Rick's going to interview me for this episode, but I may ask some questions back because Rick is an active believing Mormon. And uh, so I'm always fascinated to understand how people uh, who know more about church history than me, in Rick's case, still remain an active faithful member. So I reserve the right to return some questions back to Rick. Rick, pull your mic a little bit closer All and right. uh, I'll turn the time over to Rick of Gospel Tangents for mm. what I hope is a fun edifying interview where I'm going to try not to get too exuberant. So I'm going to try and be uncaffeinated. <laughs> you can John. be exuberant. It's fine with me. I don't, I don't mind. So, <laughs> well, thanks for the honor of wanting to interview me. Well, thank you. So, you know, John, I'm a little bit different in, in my style in that I usually, you know, I always like to go to somebody's academic history first and I'm going to, and we're going to go there, but I, I don't, I've never met anybody that dated an Oscar-winning actress, and so we got to go there first. So, <laughs> so who is this person that I'm talking about? And and l l tell that story. Okay. Well, when I was a freshman in high school at Katy High School in Katy, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston, I met Renee Zellweger at a, a speech and drama tournament. She was into speech and drama, and uh, still is, I think. Yeah, still is a little bit. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and she was just this bubbly, blonde, uh, you know, vivacious, talented human. And we became friends from that moment of my freshman year, and we were friends all through high school. We were in the same graduating class. We did date. Uh, we used to sing Beatles songs together. Uh, we, we went to Galveston Beach together. We did kiss. Uh, I, I will kiss and tell. Uh, but that's as far as it went. But I consider her one of my closest friends. We were so close that she made my girlfriends kind of jealous. Uh, but I, I we can't were never imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, she wasn't. She was cute and a cheerleader, and she was a basketball player. She was on track. But she wasn't the most desired girl in the whole high school. But she was, you know, she was up there. Mm -hmm. But she was different from maybe some of the other more popular girls. Um, she was just, she was really classy. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, she was smart, but she wasn't like an honor student. But she was smart. 
Um, but again, she wasn't the most popular of the, of the girls, but she was, yeah. So I'm, I'm repeating myself. So anyway, I wanted her, of course, as a good Mormon boy, I wanted her to be Mormon more than anything. Uh, and, uh, so I did, you know, the, the big story that you probably want me to tell is that I think it was my junior year. Um, I decided to invite her to a steak dance. So I invited her to what I remember to be the new year's Eve steak dance. Uh, and I brought her and she wore, I just wore like, as I remember, like khakis and a blazer and a white shirt and tie. That was my standard outfit back then as I recall. And she wore this lovely velvet black dress that uh, just kind of went off the shoulder. And she is, is, she's petite. She wasn't buxom or anything. So I didn't think anything of it. It was certainly modest by my standards, but even back then. And uh, as soon as we entered the chapel, uh, like some of the leaders, female leaders just immediately kind of swooped and pulled me aside and said, uh, Renee, th whoever this is, her dress isn't modest. She's either going to need to wear your jacket or go home and change. And, uh, my, I, I'm huge, you know, I'm six, six by this point, she's like five, whatever, five and change. And I was just shocked. I was just like, Oh no, wait a minute. You don't understand. She's not a member. Like we don't want to create this first impression. Can't, you know, I just thought for sure they would just like buckle and say, oh, okay, it's an, it's a non-member, no, no problem. But when I said that the leaders said, no, the girls, the other girls will be frustrated that, that someone has a, we have a double standard here. So I, I pulled Renee aside and I explained the situation, offered to let her wear my jacket. Uh, but she started crying and, uh, she asked me to take her home. So I took her home and uh, dropped her off. She didn't want to do anything. She just kind of cried and went home. Uh, I remember going back to the, weirdly, I went back to the dance and I remember just going into the chapel and lying down on one of the pews and just staring up uh, at the ceiling, just like wondering what had just happened and why she was treated this way. Um, didn't make me question the church or anything because that was off limits. Uh, but it was definitely sad. We remained very close friends. Uh, I had this sense that she, part of her wanted to go to prom with me, but I wasn't. I was student body president and on the basketball team, but I wasn't popular like the football boys were. How can you be student body president and not be popular? I'll explain. <laughs> it wasn't a voted position. Oh, really? So you you got you got chosen by the student. As I remember, you got well. You had to qualify. So you had to have served in a office on student council to run for president. So I had been president, like leader of the safety committee the year before, and no one else who ran against, no, there was no one else to run against me who had served on the committee who was a, who was a senior. So I ran on a post. Oh, wow. Uh, I, that was different than class president. Uh, the, the class president was a close friend of mine and he was super popular, but Student body president, student council president was different. So anyway, hmm. I don't know. So so they didn't I, vote for student body president at okay, all? They, there was they, no vote at all? It was technically student council president. There was no student body president in my high school. There was oh. student council president and then senior class president. So hmm. I was student council president and and my friend Chad was student senior class president. Okay. But they did vote, but I, I voted I ran unopposed. Okay. So anyway, I was popular-ish, but I was a Mormon kid in a Baptist town, kind of goofy. So I was not, and, and by the way, football ruled Texas back oh, then. It still does. And it still does. So yeah, being basketball player didn't didn't get me up there with the, with the football players. So uh, I was popular, but not that popular. So Renee chose to go to senior prom with a football player. I went with a girl I was dating. And I think maybe both of us were sad that we didn't go together. I don't know. I remember her seeing me dancing with my girlfriend at senior prom and her like, like crying and running away from the boy she was dancing with. I never actually talked to her about why that happened. In my mind, I thought it was because she was sad that we weren't 
at prom together, <laughs> but that's just my high school memory. Yeah. We stayed in touch when I went on a mission. I sent her a Book of Mormon that I wow. signed, tried to get her uh, to join the church. She wasn't buying it. And then after my mission, I, I got back in touch with her. She was at University of Texas at Austin. Um, she knew Matthew McConaughey, she said. She had been in a couple Phil Collins. I, I guess she did a couple music videos. And uh, and she told me she was going to be an actress. And she invited me down to come hang out with her. Her boyfriend had just died by suicide. He was Ooh. South African Jewish. That's just what I remember, which was interesting. But I was afraid to go see her because I was afraid I would break the law of chastity if I was with her and there was a spark there. So she invited me to go see her in Austin. I didn't, but she told me she was going to be an actress, which I kind of laughed off. And I'm like, are you serious? And she's like, yeah, I'm going to be an actress. So that was, that was the last time I talked to her um, until I was married to Margie and we were living in Chicago and I saw the trailer to Jerry Maguire. And I'm like, holy crap, that looks like Renee. And it was. And I, I don't even know that I've tried to reach out to her since she became famous. She's never reached out to me. Um, there have been times when I'm, you know, there have been times where I'm like, I wonder how, you know, if she'll, like I, a couple of times she came to Sundance and I'm like, I wonder if she'll reach out, but she never has. She probably forgot about me the moment she graduated uh, or the last time we talked. From but, Texas, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that's my Renee Zellberger story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Do you have any pictures? I, I should get a picture. We need a picture for this episode. We may have a picture together, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see that if I could. Yeah. So. so, yeah. So that's interesting. Um, you kind of mentioned your mission there, and that normally I wouldn't. I, I don't usually talk about people's missions, but you have quite a mission story. Um, and uh, I know I think it was in one of your very first episodes of Mormon Stories like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so there's probably a lot of people who haven't heard that story. And, and uh, talk, talk about your mission to Guatemala. Yeah. So I, I was a, like, I didn't ever try alcohol in high school. I didn't try smoking. I didn't try drugs. Like I, was a virgin when I graduated, you know, um, and I was seminary president and like really into church. So I was really orthodox, I believe, in my mind I was, really faithful and got called to Guatemala and did two months in the MTC under Pinnegar. I think it was Rex Pinnegar? Um, Ed Pinnegar. Ed Pinnegar. Ed Pinnegar, Ed Pinnegar. right, yeah. 88 to 90. I was under Durant, so I, I was just before, before me. you. Yeah. yeah. So Ed Pinnegar... Uh, Guatemala City North Mission, and uh, long story short, uh, went to Guatemala and immediately noticed that we were baptizing people that probably didn't have any business getting baptized, drunk people, people with Down syndrome, uh, people who didn't have all the discussions, people who hadn't been to church. And there are some companionships that were starting to baptize 10, 20, 30 a month. Um, and, uh, there was one zone in particular, the La Laguna zone where the zone leaders had over 40 baptisms in a month. And the zone had like over a hundred baptisms in a month with like four or five companionships. So several of the companionships had like 20, 30 baptisms in a month. And I'm like, there's only 30 days in a month. How do you have 40 baptisms in a month? And the whole zone's doing it. So I talked to a, a friend who was in that zone and he's like, oh yeah, dude, it's crazy. Like we'll, we'll goof off all week long. We'll swim and we'll swim. We'll go to movies. It's a party. But then on Saturdays, we'll go to a soccer field, um, gather as many, you know, young, poor children as we can. We'll go to the poorest area of town, play a soccer match with as many young kids as we can. And then we'll invite them all back to the chapel to cool off and we'll have the baptismal font filled and we'll baptize eight or 10 at a time. These are just kids. These are all like just little kids, barefoot, poor in a, the, you know, worst slums of, of Guatemala city zone 15, La Laguna. So, and you know, he even told me that like kids were doing cannonballs in the baptismal font cause there'd be no leadership at the baptism 
the missionaries had the key to the chapel and they would just baptize like 10 at a time or so more. there was no service. There was no talk about baptism, the Holy Ghost. No, I mean, they may have done all that, but there was certainly no ward mission leader there, no bishop, no primary president, no parents. There were no, there were no discussions. No signed consent form. No consent. Uh, no. These are just kids that are eight to... Eight to so seven. They, bapt they actually baptized seven-year-olds. Oh, wow. Um, from, from what I remember. So, yeah, but then the mission president loved it. Gordon Romney was my mission president, and, uh, and he loved it. He made those zone leaders APs. And then they would travel around the mission and teach these techniques to other missions. So early in my mission, I talked to President Romney about it because I was a flecha, an arrow, like I was an obedient missionary. And it seemed like a perversion of God's holy ordinances. So I talked to Gordon Romney about it, and he's like, Elder, don't worry. You know, he said that um, once they, you know, when we plan a, when, even if we just give them a Book of Mormon, that then there'll be a Book of Mormon in their home. But once they're baptized and have the gift of the Holy Ghost, even if they fall inactive, it could, it, it will give them a, a spiritual leg up for the rest of their lives. If they have the gift of the Holy Ghost that may awaken later, and I'll never forget this, he ended by saying, and even if they are never active again, we won't have to do their work for them, you know, when they're dead. They will have so had their work the done. <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, and I'd been taught exact obedience by Elder Pinniger, and that's that was the way the mission worked. And so I just, okay, I guess that's the way it's done. I didn't do that ever on my mission. Like that felt wrong to me, but I... I just, you know, and I was just a few months into my mission at the time. So he made me a branch president and his own leader early on. And, um, you know, I was branch president twice and zone leader for most of my mission. And, but towards the end, we had a zone, we had a month where the mission president made a goal that every companionship would have a baptism in the month. And because we had had a really good month before the pipeline in my zone was kind of down. Um, and so, uh, we got to the end of the month and there were two companionships in my zone, a zone leader that didn't have a baptism yet. So I got a call from president Romney. He seemed disappointed and he told me the night before, fill up your baptismal fonts in the two areas, Fry Hannes and one other area, fill up the baptismal font. The APs are going to come pick you up tomorrow morning and they're going to show you how like real leaders in the mission manage their zones. So he picks me up. They, they pick me up in their Toyota forerunner, front runner, whatever it was, land cruiser. I don't remember. Pick me up, take me to the first area, which was Fry Hannes, And they like pick up the missionaries and they're like, all right, take us to whoever you're, take us to whoever you're investigating with. And we went to one guy and he, you know, they like offered him gum and ice cream. And they're like, Hey, any way we can get you to get baptized today. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not ready. So we left and they're frustrated. And so literally they just start driving around the town and they go to the poorest part of town, drive up to the shack and they find this like 80 year old woman who was toothless and they're they, in a hut, dirt floors, like laminate. He's just like super impoverished. And they're like, hey, hermana, quiero seguir a Jesucristo y ser batizado. You know, do you want to follow Jesus and get baptized? And she's like half sane, half senile. And she's like, whatever. So they walk her down to the nearest creek where women are like washing their clothes in the creek. And she's praying to Mary on the way down. There was no discussions, no interview that I remember never been to church and they literally baptized her there in the Creek or the stream. And then they said to the missionaries, Hey, can you make sure and confirm her with the gift of the Holy ghost? We have to get to the next area. So we didn't even wait for her to get confirmed with the gift of the Holy ghost, go back up, drive to the next area and do something very similar, pressure someone else who had, who was not ready to get baptized 
And then I'll never forget on the way home, the, and this is Elder Peterson and Elder Cruz. Like I totally remember their names. Like, I mean, memory's weird. So they stop at a payphone and they call President Romney and they say, President Romney, we witnessed a miracle today. And they told him that the two Aries had gotten a baptism. And like that felt, I mean, that felt dishonest. It felt like a, a desecration of the Lord's holy ordinances. It felt deceitful. It, I felt really gross and sick inside. So at the next zone leader conference where all the zone leaders would come receive instruction, I had my interview with President Romney and I told him what had happened because in my mind, kind of naively, he would never be okay with this if he knew. Right. So I told him and weirdly he started yelling at me, telling me that I was kicking against the pricks, that I was opposing priesthood leadership. And that if I ever did something like that again, he would demote me. And cause this is the second time I had brought it up to him. Mm -hmm. And then even though my companion had more time in the area than I did, I was transferred to Uspantan Kiche, which was like, as I remember, like a five hour bus ride to the nearest telephone and like an 11 hour bus ride to the mission home. And, um, I was banished basically for questioning my priesthood leadership. And it was there. I had, I'd had uh, asthma problems. I was, it turned out I was allergic to dust mites in Guatemala. So I, uh, I had been in areas that were less dirty before. And the president knew this sends me the dirtiest, filthiest, one of the dirtiest, filthiest areas in the mission. He knew that you had asthma. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sends me to one of the dirtiest, filthiest areas in the mission. Uspantan Kiche, look it up. Like it's, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't even a telephone in the town. Imagine, you know, this is 1990, no yeah. telephone. Right. And uh, yeah, I got so sick that I called him after a month and I just said, I can't breathe here. And he says, come home, come back to the mission home. So I get on the bus, come back to the mission home. And the next day he had me on a plane flight home, just sent me home. And there was only four months to go on my mission. So I was kind of confused, but I interpreted that as him wanting to get rid of me because I was questioning. And, and by that point, we were the second highest baptizing mission in the world. According to my president, the only other mission that had more baptisms than us w was the Chile Vina del Mar mission, which had over a thousand. Um, and I just think he didn't want me per ruining month. per month. Yeah. A thousand per month. And I think he didn't want me ruining his, his good thing. So I got sent home honorably. They offered me a release four months early. And I'm like, I'm not ending my mission four months early. So I asked them to reassign me. Uh, they reassigned me to, to the Arizona um, Tempe mission. And I served my last four months there. They made me his own leader immediately when I arrived. So there was no question about my worthiness. He, I, he must have not spoke ill about me, which I was grateful for. And I served the last four months over the Spanish speaking missionaries in the um, Arizona Tempe mission. And you Gilbert, were zone leader again, Gilbert, is that right? Yeah, I was zone leader over the Spanish speaking missionaries. Gilbert Chandler Tempe, Queens Creek, kind of that area. And I actually, while I was there, Dural Woolsey was the mission president. He had just been called as an as a general authority or an air authority to go work in the Philippines. Um, and so I told him everything that happened to me thinking that president Romney was just rogue. So he said, well, he'll deal with it. He'll go report it to church headquarters. And then he, he left the mission and elder Bailey, um, David Bailey replaced him. And I never heard from Woolsey what, what happened, but I, I followed up with Bailey and uh, President Bailey, who's still alive, and he said, yeah, I did hear back from them. And um, what they said is, is that he's only got a few months left on his mission. They didn't want to cause a big stir, so they're just going to let him finish his mission, Gordon Romney. So that was in summer of, you know, 1990. I, you know, he, he gets released, I get released, go to BYU. 
I find out later he was called to the missionary committee for the church to serve on the missionary committee for the church. And he was called to lead the church's sesquicentennial committee, which led me to believe that the church was okay with what he was doing. And that was the first time I wondered whether the church, whether the fish rotted from the head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I didn't lose my testimony, but it was the first time I'm like, wow, something's wrong. So let me make sure I understand who, so who was leading? I know you said it was the sesquicentennial mission, but. No, the sesqu there was a sesquicentennial like f celebration. For Joseph Smith's death or something? Or the church's founding or something. I don't know. Okay. But, but. But but Gordon Romney, I had told, was called to lead that committee. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure. Yeah. I couldn't tell if it was him or Wolsey, but yeah, it was Romney. Not Wolsey, okay. it was Romney. Um, yeah, and so when I find out Gordon Romney's, like, might be a general authority, like, literally in my mind, I thought, missionary committee, Jessica Centennial, like, this guy may make general authority, and if he does, I don't know that my testimony could withstand that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to feel like really, and, and, and I worried about what damage he could do. So I ended up reaching out to some professors at BYU while I was there, Ted Lyon, Bill Bradshaw, Lamont Tullis. And I'm, I just like told them the situation. And they're like, it was Lamont Tullis who said, I think I'm friends with Elder Oaks. Because Lamont Tullis, interestingly, was part of the committee that Leonard Arrington selected to write that that um set of you know a set of books in the 70s in the 70s that richard bushman ended up writing joseph smith and the beginnings of early mormonism for yeah. lamont tullis was asked to write the book on the history of the church in latin america because lamont tullis had served i guess his mission in latin america he was a political science professor harvard guy brilliant i think i maybe still alive i don't know he he said, I, I know Elder Oaks for whatever reason. I'd be willing to put a cover letter on a letter you wrote to Elder Oaks. Because I was thinking about going to Nightline or like, I was like, I wanted to be heard about this because I, I literally took the gospel so seriously, I felt like it was an abomination, again, to the Lord's holy ordinances. Mm -hmm. So if the church was going to just blow it off, I was going to, I was going to do whatever I could to like make the church fix this problem before Gordon Romney was made a general authority. So I wrote a big letter, Bradshaw, Bill Bradshaw, Ted Lyon, who was the son of T. Edgar Lyon, who was an important church historian mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and Lamont Tullis all reviewed my letter. I think it was Lamont Tullis who put the cover letter on it, sent it to Elder Oaks. And then while I was um, doing Washington seminar, for BYU back in DC doing a congressional internship on Capitol Hill. I was like in my apartment and I got a call and it was literally church headquarters. Can you hold for elder Oaks, please? Wow. And elder Oaks, uh, called me and I talked to elder Oaks and he asked me a bunch of questions. He asked me if I was still active. He asked me if I, if, if my memory is that he asked me if I still had an active temple recommend, which I did. I was still worthy. Uh, I was a faithful, you know, member at BYU. Didn't mess around, and um, he he. My memory is is that he apologized for the experience that I had. I don't know if he used the word "I apologize" or if he just expressed regret. But what he did is he told me that he was going to be drafting a speech for the upcoming mission president and wives training that they do every, whatever year. And, um, that he was going to address this issue of like using sales techniques and high pressure techniques to baptize people. Cause also on my mission, if you got seven baptisms in a month, you'd get a certificate with your name on it and you'd get to stand up in front of the group and the president would hand you your certificate. And if you got 10 baptisms a month, you'd get a Janice Cap Perry serving with joy cassette tape. And then you'd also get a special lunch with the mission president and his wife, you know, so they have all these incentives to get as many baptisms as possible. And in Oaks's uh, speech that he gave um, to the mission presidents and their wives in training, 
he discouraged the use of sales techniques and high pressure techniques and sent me a copy of that speech after he gave it. Hmm. And that saved my testimony for at least another 10 years, I think, just to feel heard, to, to, to feel that direct reaching out and to see that the church was going to maybe try and do something about it. Unfortunately, I would talk to missionaries from that point further whenever I could. And I heard about, you know, baseball baptisms. I, I learned about the baseball baptisms in the UK in the early 60s, which Jeffrey Holland and Quentin Cook were a part of, by the way. Um, I learned about the, the... What do you mean they were a part of? They were, they were, they were in those missions. As like mission president? No, as, as missionaries. Oh, okay. My understanding is Quentin Cook and, and Jeffrey Holland were missionaries when um, T. Bowring Woodbury was mission president over the British Isles in the early 60s. Now, I could have that wrong, but that's my memory. Okay. But they were essentially doing the same things. Hey, Base let's play baseball. Hey, let's go get, yep. let's go cool off in the pool one. Yeah. The church, turns out the church has this long history of these techniques. It started with the baseball baptisms in the early 60s. There's an amazing Sunstone article about baseball baptisms that Michael Quinn wrote for Sunstone. It's really good. You can, it, the PDF's available online. We should include it in the show notes. Yeah. But then there were Japanese baseball, baseball baptisms that followed the same pattern. Um, and again, like they had to excommunicate thousands of British converts because they were filling up all the roles because they want American baseball was popular back then post-war UK America was great because they had helped save the British from Hitler, uh, you know, so, but they were filling up all the roles with all these young men that had no interest in actually being Mormon, but there was no way to remove them from the roles without excommunicating them. So all these missionaries had to do this cleanup where they were excommunicating. And I don't even think they had them attend a disciplinary council. They just kind of, as I understand it, had to just excommunicate thousands of converts because they were all baptized for the wrong reasons. So, you know, I learned about cheeseburger baptisms in North Carolina where they would give poor people cheeseburgers. And I heard about missionaries getting names and dates off of tombstones, which made no sense to me. And just the church has never stopped this, this problem. And it culminated in Elder Holland being sent to Chile for three years to try and clean up the mess there. Um, I did an interview with Ted Lyon, son of T. Edgar Lyon, on Mormon Stories, where he acknowledged that this happened because he was a mission president in Chile. He was an MTC president and a temple president there. And he was Elder Holland's personal interpreter when Elder Holland went down to Chile. And Elder Holland ended up closing 30 stakes while he was in Chile, had to collapse them because the country, the church was dying in Chile because they had expanded wards and stakes based on the numbers, but there was no leadership substance behind it. And it turns out Philippines has had the same experience. Elder Oaks was sent to the Philippines for the same reasons. What years were these where Holland went to Chile and Oaks went to the Philippines? To I'm, I'm rusty on that. With in the, Within the last 20 years? I would say late 90s, early 2000s. Okay. Because when I met with Elder Holland for the two lunches that I had with him, let's just say around 2009, 2010, I talked to him about his time in Chile, and he acknowledged all of this. Mm. Um including the 30 stakes. And he said there were people protesting, you know, the area offices, there were like parents protesting the area offices in Chile because their kids had been baptized without their consent. Like he said, it was a public relations fiasco for uh, the church and just, just the vitality of the wards and the units and the members there. So that's a lot. You asked, uh, <laughs> that's a big question, but anyway, well, I knew it was. <laughs> yeah. But, but that, you know, I, I can't, that was the beginning of, of my real questioning about the church was just to see, um, just to see a problem so big be generally ignored or downplayed to experience ecclesiastical abuse firsthand, to be punished for doing what was right. And then to see the top leadership bungle it and really not be able to fix it. Um, and I talked to Elder Holland about this and, uh, he was like, 
he said to me, my brother was there. Um, he said to me, people think that like, if you're an apostle, you can just change the church. And he's like, number one, if you're a junior apostle, you've got 14 other people to contend with. Uh, the, 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 you know, the leadership of the church is run by unanimous consensus. So nothing gets done if there isn't unanimity in the quorum. And until you work your way up in seniority, you're just one of like 15 voices anyway. And then even if you like tell the church what to do, you know, he, ma he made it sound like that doesn't mean the church members are going to do what you tell them to do. Um, and then he also talked about this mid-level management that it's hard to manage these mid-level managers. And, and my sense from him is, is that these mission presidents and area authorities, they're bucking to become general authorities or apostles. And so sometimes they'll engage in shenanigans that's just hard to manage and control when you've got so many around the world. So he kind of, he actually said to me, who are the brethren? Cause I, cause, cause I refer to the brethren as like the first presidency, of the quorum of the 12. And he kind of made the joke, like who are the brethren? Like, we're just a bunch of individuals. That's the sense I got that we're just a bunch of individuals trying to do our job. And if you think that one apostle can make substantive, meaningful change in this church, he just kind of laughed at that idea. Not, not expressing doubt. I, I think he's a sincere believer, but he's just like, it's way more complex than anybody would ever, would ever guess. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's, that's my story. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that's really interesting. Do you do you think it's still going on today? Or oh yeah, they, all the time. You still think it is? Every, I mean, what I got a sense for is that a mission will be sagging, and so they'll call a mission president that's like a military guy or a corporate, you know, person, and they'll go and they'll ramp up the baptisms, and then it'll get out of control, and there'll be complaints. And they'll have to tamper it down. And then when they call the next mission president, it'll be someone who goes in to clean it all up, who's more low key, who's not about the numbers. And almost every mission missionary I've talked to, there's been that kind of cycle within the mission. Um, but if you if you go to, I mean, if you go to Latin America or the Philippines and you look at the roles, um, unless they've been purging them, the activity rates in Latin America and the Philippines are like 10%. Mm -hmm. There are wards with like a thousand members on the rolls and like 50 people are attending. Like it's crazy. And, and they've been collapsing wards and stakes to try and fix this problem, but it's undeniable. And it, it, you know, how would you stop it unless they put into the, the missionary training, never baptize someone ever, without, you know, multiple times attending church and all the six discussions and a really good sense that That's they have a conviction. That's how it was on my mission. <laughs> but that wasn't in the white handbook. That wasn't in the, that wasn't in the missionary training. That might have- teach all six discussions and go to church? You think that was a rule that, that you could get back It was a rule to? in my mission. But was it a rule in the white Bible and was it a rule in the training curriculum? I would, I would be willing to bet $100 that that was not a stated rule in the missionary curriculum, that you had to um, go to church at least twice and receive all discussions before baptism. I'd be willing to, it may have been a mission specific rule, but I would be almost willing to bet a large sum of money that it was not a global policy. Well, I agree with you that it probably wasn't a global policy, but like that was a big deal. I went to South Carolina, so I was I was American. But um, but yeah, that was a big deal that we had. They had to come twice, had to teach all six discussions. Like that's and the way it my, was. I would be curious to see if what happened was a previous mission president things had gotten out of control, and so they called your mission president in to clean it all up. I'm not saying that's what happened, but that's a pattern that I've I've heard about over and over and over again. But if you talk to almost any missionary, especially in Latin America or the Philippines. They'll have stories about how either things were out of control when they were there, or they were in areas where things had been out of control before and they had to be cleaned up. Yeah. But, I mean, but it seems like I've heard those stories. It seems like it happens in Latin and South America a lot more. Um, and the until I heard your stories, I didn't know about Japan or the UK or anything like that. And the, I mean, that was back in the 60s, I guess. But it also happened in Southern California. Um, yeah. Oh, also, I guarantee it's happening in Africa right now. 
guarantee it. And the one thing that, have you ever had Matt Marinich? Is that his name? The, I don't know who that is. So there's a guy that has a website called the Kimura Project where he tracks oh. where he tracks LDS statistics in detail. I thought that was uh, Cragen. What's the nice name, Cragen? Ryan Cragen is a, is a scholar, but he doesn't do the Kimura Project. The Kimura Project is done by this guy named Matt Marinich. Peggy Fletcher often uses him as a source for her articles on church membership and growth. Mm -hmm. But check out the Kimura Project. Um, and... Uh, but just but just talk to anyone in the know. Whenever they do a census in like Brazil or Argentina or Chile or Mexico, the number of people who self-identify as Mormons is literally a fraction of the number of people that the church claims on the church membership rolls. Right. And that's because of all these people that were baptized as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old that never went to church, never had a testimony, and have never identified as Mormon but the church keeps and them on the may rolls. not have even known they were baptized. A lot of them w wouldn't even remember it because right. it was just something that happened when they were a kid, right? Right. Yeah, so that's why I'm sure your listeners, viewers know that like the church boasts 17 million or 16 whatever, 0. 0.8, but there's probably only three to four million active members across the world right now. And this has been true for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I understand it. Yeah. Have Matt Marinich on your podcast from, yeah, I'll from have the to, Kimura I'll Project. Check him out. So I, I I knew about Cragen, but I, I didn't know about him. Well, but Cragen's ex Mormon. Yeah, but he the, he does stuff on because I swear he was just on Peggy Fletcher's uh, Mormon Land podcast. Just he's brilliant, the last and month. he's a he's a you know he does social science. Yeah, but this guy Matt Marinich is is different. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. I hope that didn't take too much time. No, no. This is why we're here. <laughs> this is a big. This was my very first episode of Mormon Stories. Was it your where first? I, I tell this. Yeah, my very yeah. first episode in two thousand. So there's probably a lot of people that haven't heard this, and so it's probably good. It's been oh for sure sixteen years. Or I don't know how long. Yeah, it's seventeen been. years. Seventeen. And yeah, I don't think I've ever recorded it on video in this depth. So I'm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. No problem. Um, so let's dive in into your academic history. I usually do that. I know you went to BYU, and uh, yeah. So what what can you tell us there? Yeah. So uh, I I graduated like eleventh of my class in high school. I was a late bloomer academically, but I did get a a two year scholarship to BYU academic, um, and I was able to keep a four zero ish GPA and, and renew wow. it. So I, I had an Edwin Hinckley scholarship for my last two years at BYU, which was a full ride and full tuition and books. But I decided to study political science and international relations. Uh, I, I had a great GPA. I graduated with a 3.96 GPA, summa cum laude. Wow. And uh, did Washington seminar, got into law school, got into BYU law school, got into University of Texas law school, got waitlisted at Harvard, but didn't get in Harvard. Those are the only three law schools I applied to. But I didn't know anyone who loved their job as a lawyer. So I didn't want to just go to law school and then hate my life. I was really a believer that you had to love and believe in what you do as a career because you only live once. Um, you can't take it with you, as they say. That was a film. I watched a movie by Frank Capra called You Can't Take It With You, where that was the theme. And it was at a BYU film class that I uh, watched that movie and it just sold me on the idea that you don't just go for the money, go for a fulfilling, meaningful job. So why did you choose political science? Did you want to become a Well, politician? I chose political science before I, you know, so I, I thought, yeah, I thought I might want to be a politician. Okay. But then I went and worked on Capitol Hill and just got disillusioned with all the graft and, and, uh, with with all the special interests and the way congressmen could be bought off, and I was just disillusioned. So that was after you graduated from BYU. That what? That you started working in. in Capitol no, Hill? it was during Washington seminar between my junior and senior year. Oh, okay. Which was the same time Elder Oaks called me. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. But it was there that I then I was stuck with my degree because I couldn't go back at that point. So I finished political science, applied to law school. But at the, by that point, I knew I didn't want to be a politician, and I, I just was unsure about law as a career I would enjoy. Okay. So, um, so you you graduated, and then 
Well, you ended up at Microsoft somehow. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can tell us about that. Yeah. How, how did you so what Microsoft? happened was, what happened was I got married in the DC temple to Margie and, uh, um, my first real job was with Bain and company, which was Mitt Romney's company. So I was at Bain when Mitt Romney was at Bain. I was Do you know the, Mitt? No, Is no. Is he related to Gordon Romney? Yeah, Mitt, Mitt, Mitt Romney and Gordon Romney were cousins for sure. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, went to Bain, Dallas. Mitt was at Bain Capital in Boston. Mm -hmm. I was in Bain, Dallas. And, and uh, Bain is a management consulting firm that helps turn around Fortune 500 companies. So I did that, uh, but that's when the internet first emerged. So this is around 1994. I first saw my Netscape Navigator and the you know the internet being used, and uh, I, I I was just like, whoa, this is going to be big. So I left Bain, went to Chicago to work for Arthur Anderson, which was a big accounting, which was the number one accounting firm at the time. They were big into tech. My brother had worked there before he left for Microsoft. Went to uh, Arthur Anderson, started to learn computers, eventually became a programmer, did computer programming for a few years, including- So Arthur Anderson, I always thought of them as like an accounting firm. Yeah, they were an accounting and audit firm. They were the largest one in the world, based in Chicago. But they had they were cutting edge with, with tech. And so I went there as part of their te tax and technology group so I could learn computers. So I didn't need an accounting degree to be able to help them run their computers. So it was just like a boot camp. It was like a tech boot camp. So they just trained you to become a programmer essentially? No, they trained me to be like a IT systems guy. And then uh, I left after only a year. And then I joined a tech consulting firm called Parian where I taught myself to program. I mean, there was so much of a demand for programmers. Right that you could teach you could literally like bring a programming book to work, set it there on the table, ask them what they needed. And you could like learn on the job, studying the, the manual and programming. And I, I did some self-study, took some exams, um, got hired on Perry and as a computer programmer in Chicago and just started programming. And you just taught yourself how to program. Yeah. What did you use? I'm yeah. just curious. I'm a, I'm a computer science guy, so. <laughs> so what, did, what, what programs? Yeah. What, okay, so I started um, doing Visual Basic for applications. Okay, I know a little Visual Basic. VBA. Yeah. So that I did that in Excel and in Access. So Same I, here. <laughs> so, I learned, so I learned Access is my database, VBA is my programming language, and then I learned Visual Basic, Visual right. Basic 4, um, and then slowly I learned SQL Server so I could do a enterprise backend. Because Access wasn't big enough. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And I love Access to this day. I still use it to do my donor I do too. statements <laughs> at the end of the year. Um, yeah, so I was a VB SQL Server programmer for okay. the most part. Okay. I did that. Sorry yeah. we got a little nerdy there. but no, I, I love it. No, I love it. I love it. I'm sorry to the audience. They're no. probably like, what are they talking about? No, there's always somebody that's like, I love VB or oh, I, I do client server programming. Did that for a couple of years. One thing that people always like to hear the story of is that I, after I worked at Perrion for a bit, we wanted to move back to Salt Lake. So we, like around 96, 97, we moved to here to Salt Lake in Cottonwood Heights and I got a job at church headquarters. Oh. So I worked one year at church headquarters during their Y2K initiative. Oh, I remember that. They were converting data ease these are DOS based databases, a data ease databases into access databases. Mm. And because I had programming with access, they brought me on. Right. And, um, the coolest thing I did for the year I worked at the church was I worked on a general authority candidate tracking system where they in access, they had a database where they would track mission presidents, temple presidents, and stake presidents. And whenever area authorities or general authorities would go out in state conferences to interview all these people, they needed kind of like a knowledge man management system to track the progress of these potential general authority candidates over time. So they'd ask them questions about their financial situation. Did they have any debt? How was their wife? How were their kids? Were there any members of the family that had mental illness? and other impressions, and they would track uh, these candidates for general authority until they selected them. So that was the coolest thing. 
I think Greg Brown was working in the area office in the in the uh, presidency of the seventy office at the time, and that that was my coolest assignment while mm. I was at church headquarters. And so if somebody had mental illness in their family, they were disqualified? Well, I can't say how the final decision was made. I'm sure nepotism was highly uh, involved in that decision. <laughs> but I, that was a factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. If, if there, I mean, you, you, you can imagine if, if, if there's a family member who would be very embarrassing to the church once this person started rising in the ranks of leadership – they would want to screen for that. Like a Billy Carter with Jim. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> Billy Carter. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, a wife with a drug addiction or a alcohol, alcohol addiction, you know, whatever. Right. Huh. A gay son. Right. Heaven forbid. Well, uh, that's not a problem anymore, is it? I mean, we've come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Any other insights into your year at the church there? Uh, no, I mean, it was just super bureaucratic nice people. It was super inefficient and bureaucratic, uh, super inefficient. It was there that I got hold. I wish I had this information. It was there because of my experience on my mission. I wanted to know, um, what the activity rates were for the church. And because I did some consulting for like the cons building construction department in the church for constructing chapels, mm -hmm. I was able to get the data for act for total membership per ward or branch and then active membership per ward or branch in the church. And I, I, I imported all that into Excel or access and I crunched the numbers and I found like a one third activity rate globally back then. And, um, you know, I, at the time I would never have shared that. I, you know, I didn't want to violate confidentiality. So I don't have that data and uh, I didn't publish it, but that's when I was like, whoa, it really is what I thought. It really is around a third. So a third of the people the church claim are active. Uh, you know, a third of the members that the church claims are actually active. And I think it was only a third of those were temple recommend holders. So anyway, that was interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So your brother used to work at the church, right? Did he help you get that job? or and, and does he still work at the church? So he had nothing to do with me getting the job for the church because he was at Microsoft at the time. Okay. Um, so I worked at the church before he did. Oh, interesting. But while he was at Microsoft, he helped, he helped me find leads to apply. It took me seven times to get hired, seven formal interviews over multiple years to get hired at Microsoft. This is the time where if you got hired at Microsoft – you get stock options and within five years, you'd be a millionaire, you know, it's just, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard, really competitive to get in. So it took me seven tries, but eventually I got in around 97, 98, I got hired at Microsoft while my brother Joel had been there for several years. So that's when we moved to Seattle, left working for the church. And I did seven years at Microsoft in Redmond. And you got stock options and you're a millionaire now? I got stock options. But uh, no, I left. I left between the appreciation on my house and the vested stock options, and us paying down our mortgage. I uh, I left Microsoft with like two hundred forty thousand dollars, and we used that to buy our house in Logan with cash, so that we wouldn't have a mortgage. Wow! So uh, nice. because Microsoft was a great career, I met Bill Gates twice. I presented on stage with Steve Ballmer, the CEO, who now is the owner of the Clippers. Right. Um, had a really rapid ascent. I, I did demos, technical support for the sales force, speech writing for executives, and then business management for VPs. But I was always depressed inside because I had my faith crisis at Microsoft while I was teaching seminary for the church in my Issaquah ward. And... Um, and I just got super depressed. So for the last three or four years of my time at Microsoft, I was like unshaven, wore Birkenstocks. Wow. Like just depressed because the, I, I, I studied, you know, um, the seminary institute manuals. That's where it started. Um, got church history in the fullness of times, that dark green manual and learned a bunch of stuff. And that was troubling. So then I, read Bushman's book, um, 
Joseph Smith and the beginnings of early Mormonism. I read about Leonard Arrington and, and Lowell Benyon. Um, and then eventually I went to Michael Quinn and, um, you know, I read Simon Southerton, Losing the Lost Tribe. I, um, you know, uh, Eugene England and, and Lowell Benyon biographies. And then eventually I read Fawn Brody, knows, No Man Knows My History. And that's what, that's what kind of, well, that and Bushman's book, it was a, it was the one, two punch. It was Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History. But then Bushman's book confirming basically all the stuff that I read in, in No Man Knows My History, knowing that he had been a, was a patriarch and a state president and a, a faithful Mormon. I could always discredit Brody as being, as being having an ax to grind and as not being credible. But once I paired Bushman's confirmation with Brody's history, it's like, well, this is true. He was a folk magic treasure digger and he was a polygamist and he lied about it. And one of my friends named Paul at Microsoft introduced the term polyandry to me because I thought it was the polygamy that was disturbing. But he's like, have you ever heard of the polyandry? And I'm like, what's that? You know, because this is back in 2001, 2002. There's no podcasts. There's no Facebook. There's no Instagram. There's no CES letter. There's just books. There's not even a website. It's like Sunstone barely had a website. And all it did was release like the September 6th anniversary videos. And even Sunstones weren't online yet. So there's no, how, how would you learn about the church except through books? And none of the books mention the word polyandry, by the way. Um, that I'm aware of. I thought Rough Stone Rolling did, but I, I think it Rough Stone Rolling came years later. So oh, I'm okay. talking about 2000, 2001. Okay. I think Rough Stone Rolling was released in 2004, 2005. Okay. But I, I, does the, does the word polyandry sh appear in Rough Stone Rolling? I'm not sure. I think it does. It might. It's been a long time since it I might. read it. And, um, I mean, that was, <laughs> it was really troubling to me. I'll, I'll tell you that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it doesn't appear like, Joseph Smith and the beginnings of early Mormonism, because it was part of that Leonard Arrington series, it only covered like pre Joseph, pre Joseph Smith's ministry to like the founding of the church. So it didn't talk about polygamy at all. So okay. there wasn't rough stone rolling yet. So, so, but you were bothered by the treasure digging in Joseph Smith and the beginnings of Mormonism. I was bothered by it all. I was bothered by, um, I was bothered by the treasure digging, the peep stone in the hat. I was bothered by the Kirtland Bank scandal, uh, by Mountain Meadows Massacre, and that the fact that the church would teach about Hans Mill in its curriculum, but I, I could never find any any teachings about the Mountain Meadows back then. So I'm like, why would you make us feel sorry for you with Hans Mill Massacre, but never take ownership of, of Mountain Meadows? That's just my memory of... of how the church handled those types of things. Um, but then I was troubled by the polygamy, by the cover up, by learning what actually happened at Carthage jail where Joseph Smith was basically killed for lying and for his polygamy and, and, oh, and just the whole like l head of the Nauvoo Legion and like marching soldiers into neighboring towns and the way he manipulated the, the, the political parties in Illinois and, and kind of deceived them and was just kind of, you know, and then the council of 50 and the Danites, all that stuff was just like, this guy was crazy. This guy was completely out of control. He lost his marbles and he's like cheating on his wife, calling it polygamy from God and lying about it to almost everybody. And I just couldn't square that with, and I never. So you felt this way back in the late nineties, er, early two thousands, or early two thousands. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, that, for sure. I, mean, I lost because I, I just remember when you started Mormon stories. It seemed like you were a lot more neutral, um, but you you had you were you were pretty much disbeliever. Okay, you're raising a really important point. So let me go back. I, yeah, the thing is, I don't want us to take where you are today and, and then say, that's how I was in 2000 or whatever. I yeah, I'm trying this to get is your a, mindset. This is a really useful line of questioning. And it, there's, a, there's some ethical stuff there that I always had to kind of struggle with. So let me go back. So in, while I was at BYU, the September 6th were excommunicated. So I was at BYU in the fall of 93. Mm -hmm. And I, I was there. I, I went to a press conference held by Paul Toscano and several others like at a local hotel there in Provo 
where they're like doing a press conference about their excommunications. So you're still in college. You're yeah. a political science major. Yeah. Um, One thing I didn't mention is that- You're back, still a believer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So back during those days, BYU had this honors program at the Mazer building, which was freaking amazing. And they had these types of courses called honors colloquium, where they would group your general education courses up. And what you would do is you would- you would um, sign up for honors colloquium that was a six hour credit hour commitment each semester for a full year. And you'd be in this big cohort of like 60 students who had all meet at the Mazer building for two hours a day of, of coursework instead of one. And it, you would, they would, they would, you know, in my case, there was Ted Lyon, uh, Lynn England from sociology. So Ted Lyon was Spanish literature, Lynn England, was sociology. And then Clayton White was an ornithologist in the biology, bio, bioscience department. He was a hawk expert, bird, guy. bird yeah. guy. So they would group teach you and they would integrate science with literature, with, with social studies. You would have this big cohort of the most intelligent students on campus and it would cover a full year four of your GEDs you would knock out all at once through this integrated experience with this cohort of brilliant honor students. So most, most students took that as a freshman. Um, and I didn't mention when I was a freshman, I was in the honors dorm and I, Mary Holland, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Holland's daughter was in our ward. So I got to date Mary Holland um, as a freshman at BYU. Wow. And I got to play tennis with Elder Holland once because Mary set up a tennis match and I beat him like 6-0. Kind of <laughs> um, but he had just ruptured his Achilles and was healing from that. So wow. I mean like, but I, I did play tennis with Elder Holland once and I did date his daughter, Mary. Um, and then she dear John to me, so to speak, not literally, but she, <laughs> she married a doctor while I was on my missions or an aspiring med, med student. Well, your name is John. So you would get, dear I know John I got no dear John what. no matter what, <laughs> but, uh, I was in the honors dorm my freshman year, but I, I wasn't in the honors program really, but so I didn't do cloak. So I didn't do colloquium as a freshman, but, but when I got off my mission and met Ted Lyon, he encouraged me to join honors colloquium. So I did. And so I was a sophomore in the honors colloquium program at BYU. And it was there that they would like bring in Van de Graaff to talk about evolution. They would, they would bring in um, scientists to talk about the global flood. They would talk about abortion and, you know, they'd, they'd bring in Bill Bradshaw to talk about in vitro fertilization and the implications of, of abortion as it related to spirits and spontaneous abortions and fetuses. Like it was, it was like professors that were Sunstone and dialogue readers at BYU in this course where they would tackle head on all of the most controversial issues in the church, including feminism while the September 6th were getting excommunicated. And so was Eugene England at BYU at that time? Do you know? Uh, yeah. Eugene okay. England was, but this was Lynn England. So that I brothers or something or no, nope. no, just not really different. Okay. But Eugene England was there. I never took a class from Eugene England, but okay. my, Margie did my, I think my, my wife, Margie, but, um, but this was really interesting because I was exposed as a sophomore to, I mean, I had doubts growing up. I, the one true church thing always felt weird to me. Polygamy always felt weird to me. And the black priesthood ban always felt weird to me. And I was surrounded by Baptists and Katie, and they had watched The Godmakers. And so, you know, I, I, I was familiar with rumblings about, you know, um, Mormonism and stuff and critics of Mormonism. So, like, I always, I, I, um, I read the Book of Mormon cover to cover as a junior in high school, prayed, did follow Moroni's promise, and I never got the answer. I actually prayed twice that night or morning and never got the witness that my, that my seminary teacher sort of promised me that I'd get. And I, you know, I struggled with that. So even up through the MTC, I, I couldn't say that I knew the church was true. I believed it was true. I loved it. I was obedient to it. I was one of its best spokespeople, you know, in the, where I grew up, 
but I, I couldn't say I knew it. All I could say is I hoped it or I believed it. So um, on my mission, I just said, I'm going to just tell people I know when I don't and just hope that the testimony follows saying you know. So, um, yeah, and so I served a successful mission, had that problem, but I always had cracks, questions in my mind. I once divided, as, as a high school sophomore, I think, I divided the number of Mormons in the world by the total number of people in the world, and it was less than one half of 1%. And I'm just like, really, Heavenly Father? Like, that's the best you can do with your one true church is like one less than one half of 1%. That seems really inefficient, but I just, I put those things on the shelf. So when I was at BYU, as a sophomore, I took this honors colloquium class, got exposed to all the controversial issues and learned about Sunstone and dialogue. But I also learned about Lowell Benyon. When was the uh, message about warning about symposia? What year was that? I mean, it was all leading up to those September 6th Wasn't communications. It so they so did, you were they, learning about Sunstone from BYU professors who were going to Sunstone. Is that right? Or they were reading Sunstone, but may have been afraid by that point to actually attend. But they were certainly plugged into, you know, because Eugene England had started dialogue back in the 60s. Right. He was a BYU professor still. Right. And um, yeah, this was during the time where. And it was probably a little bit before 93 that that warning on symposium came out. But they basically warned about study groups prior, you know, in the years prior. And then they warned about Sunstone or Symposia. Yeah. And then, you know, the the crap really hit the fan when when these, um, when these when the September 6th were excommunicated. But that wasn't the only controversy. While I was at BYU, there was a big mother in heaven controversy where Cecilia Conchar-Farr, who was a feminist professor, English, English department at BYU, and Gail Houston, also a feminist uh, English department person at BYU, they were talking a lot about Mother in Heaven and praying to Mother in Heaven. And then David Knowlton, who's still alive, if you haven't interviewed him yet, you really should. He was a BYU professor, sociologist, that was talking about the church uh, missionary program in Latin America and you know the CIA. He, he did an article in Sunstone about phallic symbols in Mormon architecture. He was also gay. Um, but several professors at BYU were kind of let go or denied continuing status mm -hmm. because of their publishing in, in Dialogue or Sunstone. So that was happening. Gail Houston, Cecilia Farr, and D David Knowlton were all let go. David Wright, who was a historical criticism guy that inspired David Bakavoy, he was excommunicated and let go from BYU around this time. And then, um, and then the September 6th stuff happened. So all that's happening. And Joanna Brooks is leading feminism, feminist marches at BYU as a fellow student. I didn't know her, but I would see her and I'd be like, wow, that's, she's impressive. And all of that was going on while I was a BYU student. Mm -hmm. So, but the, but those the, were the liberal days of BYU apparently, huh? I mean, yeah. I mean, and the 17th and student review, which was an alternative newspaper, you could, you could read the daily universe or you could read the student review, which would talk about all the controversies. Mm -hmm. And there was the seventh East press before the student review. Right. And so, yeah, there was a lot of intellectual fervor and liberal and conservative kind of stuff going on at BYU. My saving grace w were these were Bill, Bill Bradshaw, who 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 believed in evolution, you know, was probably pro-choice, but he had served as a mission president in Vietnam and as a stake president, and was faithful, but had been to Harvard, but was faithful. And Ted Lyon and Lynn England and Clayton White all presented as faithful, and they introduced me to Eugene England, Lowell Benyon, Leonard Arrington, um, and the book the book A Thoughtful Faith that was edited by Phil Barlow, which was this collection of essays of people like Richard Bushman, Laurel Thatcher, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, and many, many other faithful Mormon intellectuals and scholars. So I read A Thoughtful Faith, and I'm like, oh, wow, you can stay in the church and still have doubts or questions or even be a semi-believer. You can be a buffet Mormon, but still stay in the church. And the same thing with, you know, Lowell Benyon, like, that dude's freaking amazing. And he was able to stay in the church. Eugene England, you know, Leonard Arrington. I'm like, I can do this. 
you can stay in the church as a liberal, but still be faithful. So that got stuck in my brain by the time I graduated from BYU. Now, the reason I went so back to So did you identify that, as a liberal at this time? At probably. BYU? Okay. Probably. Yeah. As a liberal Mormon, maybe. Yeah. Um, that wasn't also, a curse word. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> the other really important essay that I was introduced to was Richard Paul. It's spelled Paul, but it's pronounced Paul. Yeah, His essay, um, What the Church Means to People Like Me. And he introduced this concept of a Liahona Mormon versus an Iron Rod Mormon in the essay. And Iron Rod Mormon is like a closed minded, dogmatic, Orthodox Mormon that closes their eyes, holds onto the rod, and does what they're told, believes what they're told. A Liahona Mormon is somebody that, you know, the Liahona only worked when you asked it questions and it would respond, but it took faith and you didn't know where you were going to go and you had to use your own thinking and process. And so the, the essay introduces this idea of you can, you can be a liberal progressive Mormon and you don't have to believe everything or follow everything. And that just blew my mind open because I had not been raised that way. So, and then, and then um, Eugene England had this essay, what the church means to people like me, where he talked about the church being good. Like, like it's a place where you can practice Christianity and the ward setting is a, is a place where you can, express Christianity and the flaws are, or the, the bugs are features because you learn to be a better Christian by all the imperfections in the church. And it was this type of liberal progressive Christianity, Mormonism that I was inoculated with as a BYU student such that when, so I leave in 93, go to Bain, you know, go to Parian, work for the church, end up at Microsoft, lose my faith fully because right? you were a seminary teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and I early morning that sucks, right? Uh, or you, was, you're yeah. more of an early morning person than me, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, I get up at 4 or 5 Ugh. most of the time without an alarm clock. <laughs> wow. But uh yeah, so a year and a half into my seminary, I lose my faith fully. This time it was fully. Cuz I didn't know all the stuff. I didn't I, I learned all that sunstony stuff, but I didn't really learn about the stone in the hat. I didn't learn about the polyandry. I didn't learn about Joseph Smith lying. Like I didn't know all the details about it because I'd never read No Man Knows My History. I had only seen Hugh Nibley's pamphlet, No Ma'am, That's Not History, mocking No Man Knows My History. And I thought, well, that's dangerous. I can't read that. That's apostate kind of stuff. So I was okay with Sunstone and Dialogue, not okay with Farm Brody. Fast forward to my time at Microsoft, lost my faith fully, but then Leonard Arrington, Lowell Benny, and Eugene England were there to catch me. And even though it was a dark night of the soul for me, I I thought, no, but let's keep the spirit of Lowell, Benny, and Eugene, and Lenny, you know, let's keep the spirit of them alive. And so I wrestled for a few years trying to figure out what to do. And then I said, I'm going to leave Microsoft. I'm going to quit this dream job, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, stock options, no Bill Gates, rising, I, I, I'm not trying to brag, rising star in the company, in many ways, I'm going to leave it all behind because life isn't worth living if you don't love and believe in what you do. And I'm not getting fulfillment helping Microsoft sell more boxes of software. This is my calling. And I don't know how I'm going to be a help be a solution to this problem, but I'm going to do my best. And at the time, 2004, iPods were like in beta. I'm not talking about iPhones. I'm talking about iPods. Right. Like I'm not even sure the first iPod had really come out yet. Bluetooth hadn't really been implemented. And certainly podcasts were not a thing. So I leave in 2004. I get a job at, at Utah State in a PhD program where I could work with MIT. And I started in this field called instructional technology that tried to marry education with technology. But I got to work with MIT. So I'm like, this seems like a cool landing spot to try and figure out what my next steps would be to help solve this faith crisis problem. Cause at Microsoft, I had met a lot of Mormons who were closet non-believers at Microsoft who were gay, but they didn't want to tell their spouse or they were got caught masturbating by their spouse. And now we're like in the doghouse or they lost their faith but they couldn't tell anyone and they were all like depressed and broken or divorced from faith crisis stuff all at Microsoft. And I'm like, there's no, there's no help for these people. 
and I'm struggling. And it's just unacceptable that the church has no support for people like me, for people like my friends at Microsoft. And so I left Microsoft, came to Logan, got into PSU program, went went in, in instructional technology. And during that first year, 2000, 2000, 2004 to 2005, I attended my first Sunstone. Dan Witherspoon was the executive director. And I met the dialogue crowd. And, um, and I uh, discovered the blogger knackle. So right then in 2004, I discovered- uh, What was on the blogger knackle back then? There wasn't much, was there? <laughs> no, there, no, there was times and seasons. Okay. And uh, feminist Mormon housewives around then and by common consent okay. and millennial star. So there were like at least four prominent blogs that were, that's where all the action was happening. That plus there were some, there was a, there was a internet forum called new order Mormon that was basically advocating for what's called a middle way where you could be a non-believer or a buffet Mormon, but still stay faithful. It was called new order Mormon. I'm super bummed that that website doesn't exist anymore. So you could go on there and chat with all these people that are making the church work, even though they don't believe anymore. And then there were some ex more, there was the ex Mormon forum by that point, ex Mormon.org. It's probably still around. And then there was like Zion city limits or ZLMB view from the foyer. There were these other forums. They're like chat forums, mm -hmm. bulletin boards where you would have these really in-depth arguments by text about the church and its history and its truth claims and current events. So between the, the bulletin boards and forums, the blog and, and the blogs, uh, there, there was a lot and Sunstone, there was like this rich Mormon intellectual discourse that I got introduced to in 2004. And, um, I, I went to Dan Witherspoon and I'm like, dude, you need to get with the internet cause the internet's going to be big. And at some point he brought me on, they made me executive director of Sunstone and I created the first, I created a Sunstone podcast. You were podcast. the Lindsay Hanson Park of Sunstone? I was the Dan Witherspoon, Albert Peck, Peggy Fletcher Stack, Lindsay Hanson Park of Sunstone. Wow, for, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I was on the Sunstone board and then they made me executive director. And uh, I created a podcast called Sunstone Podcast. And I did a few episodes. I interviewed Armand Moss. Um, I interviewed a few other people, Richard I'm Dutcher. I never got Armand on my podcast. He passed yeah. away. So we'll I've got an episode Armand. where I interviewed Armand. I remember that. It was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I tried to help Sunstone come into the internet age. Dan and I didn't see eye to eye. Love the guy. But I resigned from Sunstone because uh, just too much tension with Dan on on how to where to take Sunstone. He was still stuck in like the publication magazine mode. I, I helped with the digitization of Sunstone Magazine to put it on the web. I was proud of being involved in that. Tried to start a Sunstone podcast, but that I was, I wasn't going to leave my job with MIT to like argue with Dan Witherspoon about the direction of Sunstone. <laughs> so like that's what's funny Sunstone was MIT. dying. Sunstone was dying. It was hemorrhaging. The magazine was losing subscriptions. They were tanking in revenue and I wasn't going to risk leaving MIT to like have to pull Dan Witherspoon along. And I love Dan. He's a brilliant person, but I, I just, I, I had to resign from that. So you were working at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for mm -hmm. those who don't know what that stands for, uh, while living in Logan. Yep. And you started OpenCourseWare, is that right? Yeah, I was the executive director of... MIT's Open International Open Courseware Consortium. We actually use that at Western Governors University, so I'm I I've used that. Fun. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. You, you basically wrote the code for that, or no? What what my job there? Well, I helped Utah State had a team that built some software to support the releasing of course materials online for free. Right. Um, but my role was director of the international consortium, so. I would go to universities in Japan and China and you know in the United States and teach them about open courseware and try and get them to commit to releasing their course materials online for free and then to join the consortium where we would meet you know once a year every other year twice a year whatever and try and 
grow a movement of universities sharing their education materials for free. So I got to go to Spain and Japan and China, all as, a, as the the director of the Open Stories Courseware Initiative. And I was I was told Open Stories of the Open. What I say? You said Open Stories. Yeah, Open Courseware Initiative. <laughs> um, yeah, I was um, I uh, um, I was there, I was told I was MIT's only employee west of the Mississippi. So, oh. so yeah, that was a cool thing. I named. The Open Stories Foundation, inspired by the Open Courseware. So the Open Courseware Consortium was inspired by the open source software movement. Right. And then I named my nonprofit the Open Stories Foundation, inspired by by those two things. So, yeah. So um, parallel to working with Sunstone, I while I was in that USU program in 2004, I learned about blogs, I learned about wikis, and I learned about this thing called podcasts. And I, I had an iPhone, or I had an iPod before iPhones even came out, and I downloaded iTunes. Was that contraband at Microsoft? I guess you were out of Microsoft by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Microsoft, you know, Bill Gates wasn't a big fan of the internet back in the day, believe yeah. it or not. So Microsoft was resisting all this web stuff. Neither was Novell. Yeah. I was a big Novell guy. I don't know if you knew that. but Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I worked for WordPerfect. Uh, I don't like WordPerfect, but I thought Novell had some amazing yeah. networking software. Well, I worked for WordPerfect after Novell had bought WordPerfect. Oh, okay. So I worked for that. Anyway, so in 2004, all the blogs are happening, wikis, but but there were only a couple podcasts. There was one called, um, there was one called Catholic Mormon. I remember that one. And there was one, Mike Norton had a podcast called The Church Is Not True. Very subtle. Very subtle named podcast <laughs> with this person that he um, co-hosted with this guy named Mike. And uh, there was maybe one other, This Mormon Life, I think it was called. Yeah, to to Dallas to Robbins? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, podcasting is going to be huge. You know what I mean? Um, Did you start Mormon Matters before... Mormon stories? No, Mormon stories was first. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, I almost named Mormon stories a thoughtful faith. In fact, the first name I decided on was a thoughtful faith, but then I attended a storytelling, digital storytelling course in Hawaii at some instructional technology conference where I learned about digital storytelling. And I just got converted to the idea that stories were the most powerful way to communicate with people. So last minute I changed the name of the podcast from a thoughtful faith inspired by Phil Barlow's book, right? Mm -hmm. To Mormon stories. And I released it in 2005, that first episode about my mission. While I was still trying to work with Sunstone and dialogue, I, I was trying to consult dialogue. I met with the dialogue board, tried to convince the dialogue board to partner with Sunstone, well, to partner with me and Mormon stories. Steve Evans ended up creating By Common Consent, and there was a relationship between By Common Consent blog and dialogue for many years. Um, but that's when I became friends with Greg Prince. He was on the dialogue board, and he was the first person I interviewed for Mormon Stories after my solo episode. I interviewed Mike Norton's partner, Mike. I mean, Mike Norton's partner, uh, I'm forgetting what his fake name was at the time, but yeah, 2005 is Roasted when it all Roasted Tomatoes, started. was that it? Roasted Tomatoes was uh, Jason, Nel Jay Nelson Seawright at the time. He and his wife, Taryn, were bloggers. Um, They had a podcast called like Latter-day Liberation Front, but I think they also blogged for By Common Consent. Mm. But that was a- This is a good history of the blogger tackle. <laughs> that was the first mixed faith couple I, or or like- couple that I interviewed on Mormon stories really early on roasted tomatoes and serenity Valley was their fake names from the blogs. But anyway, th that was a really, really long way of talking about what my motives were when I started Mormon stories. So you asked an hour ago, like what my belief status was when I started Mormon stories, right. I absolutely knew that the Mormon church was not what it claimed to be that the truth claims would not, could not hold up, that the Book of Mormon was not historical, that the Book of Abraham was a problem, uh, and that the church wasn't the one true church. 
for sure. And I'd been inoculated with enough progressive Mormonism by that point that I believed all we needed was sunshine. That if we could talk openly about the church's problems and the truth claims, talk openly about the racism, the homophobia, the sexism, feminism, and administration problems, that somehow we could find a way to have thoughtful faith, integrated progressive faith. And so my explicit intention of Mormon stories was to keep people from leaving the church because I thought that was a bad thing. I thought people shouldn't leave the church because I felt like the church was the best way to live, the best way to raise your kids, the best way to be a moral person, the best way to find community and spirituality. I felt no one should leave the church, but everyone should talk openly about the problems and together as a community, as we confront the problems with the internet, with podcasts, with blogs, with open discourse, we'll just, the church will improve and we'll all move together towards a, a Zionic state. Or I would get excommunicated. One of the two, but. So you knew that was a possibility. Oh, for, I mean, I'd lived in the September 6th era at BYU. So yeah, when I bought that first microphone and published that first episode on my mission story, I, I said, this could very well end in me being excommunicated, but the church had taught me do what is right, let the consequence follow. They had taught me dare to do right, dare to be true. There is no work. There is a work that no other can do. Um, that that honesty is super important. So and and oh say what is truth, tis the fairest gem that the riches of men can produce. And priceless, the value of truth will be when the proud monarch's costliest diadem is counted but dross and refuse. Like, truth matters. So That's a hymn for those of you who don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, say what is truth. Oh, say what is truth. So, so yeah. So, for me, I had learned too well that honesty and truth mattered. I'd seen the cover-ups on my mission. I'd seen a bunch of scholars be excommunicated unfairly. And I'm like, maybe this time with the internet, we'll try an experiment. We'll do faithful, thoughtful, honest discourse, transparent. And it was just an act of faith that the church would, would support that. If I worked really hard to not, so I had a couple of rules, never criticize the brethren directly. So in the, in the several first years of Mormon stories, probably until 2013, you probably won't hear me criticizing the brethren a lot. And, you know, you can, you can discuss truth claims, but never like openly express disbelief about truth claims. So even early on, when my friend Paul interviewed me, the guy who introduced me to polyandry, he interviewed me on Mormon stories, like episode 30 to 33. Even then I'm questioning, like I'm questioning the atonement a little bit. Like I'm, questioning this idea that God had to kill his son, you know, um, mm -hmm. th that sort of thing to make everything right. Uh, and that we needed a savior at all. But generally speaking, um, yeah, that was my motive was it was a naive idealistic attempt at, uh, encouraging open, honest, thoughtful, transparent discord within Mormonism and I knew that either, uh, yeah, either the church would change in very positive ways or I'd be excommunicated. But at that point, truth mattered so much that, uh, and, and I saw, you know, by then I was aware of the LGBT problems. I had learned about Stuart Mattis and his death by suicide on the steps of church head, you know, of, of his local Mormon church building. Mm -hmm. I'd become an LGBT advocate by 2004, 2005. I had become a feminist. Um, so, uh, and, and I, and I felt like the priesthood ban was not of God. So I, uh, I just, I just said, I'm going for it. And I don't know if it's going to peter out and die. I don't know if this podcast thing will take off. I don't know if anyone's ever going to listen. Um, but this will be, this is my calling. Like for my whole life, 
even at Microsoft, I'd like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with my life? I'm supposed to have a meaningful job, a meaningful career. Being rich and working at Microsoft wasn't fulfilling. Couldn't be a lawyer, couldn't be a politician. Business is empty. And I felt like I had found my calling. So 2005 was when I launched the podcast. And uh, um, really early on, um, I... I learned that a couple people had either lost their faith or even had gotten divorced after listening to Mormon stories. And it really freaked me out. I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm the reason why people are getting losing their faith and leaving the church sometimes. I'm the reason why some people got divorced and my parents had been divorced. And so I was really wanting to prevent divorces with Mormon stories that were unnecessary. And so I even took Mormon stories down a few times prior to my PhD program. Once or twice, it was it was out of sadness for seeing that it caused that that some people would cite Mormon stories when they lost their faith or divorce. Um, but then also it was just getting overwhelmed by the responsibility of it all, and wondering about whether I was doing good. Um, so uh, so that happened, but overwhelmingly the feedback was you're helping me stay in the church. Thank you for Mormon stories. Now I see that there's a middle way. Now, if, if you can, if you, John can be accepted in the church, I think maybe there's a place for people like me in the church. And I, I just, I love this open discussion. It, it renovates my interest in Mormonism. So I would get for every one person who left the church, citing Mormon stories, I'd get a thousand emails from people saying that it helped them stay in the church. And even during those first several years where my bishop might call me in and question me about Mormon stories, I would, I would just go to my listeners and say, Hey, there's a, there's a blog episode where I'm like, Hey, my bishop's giving me a hard time. He's worried that the Mormon stories is causing people to leave the church and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people emailed me or sent me letters where they would bear witness that Mormon stories was helping them stay in the church. And then I like printed them all out and bound them and brought them to my Bishop. And I said, Hey Bishop, here's several hundred people saying Mormon stories helped them stay in the church. And he's like, all right, you got my blessing. You can, you know, can keep doing Mormon stories. So there were at least two formal inquiries by my Bishop into whether or not Mormon stories was an excommunicable offense prior to my ultimate excommunication where I was exonerated. Um, where, uh, where do you think that pressure came from? Was it from, did, was it the bishop just really worried or was it from higher than that? Well, I, I, you know, I do think there were members of the ward that might have expressed concern. No one would have ever told me that later. There were definitely ward members that were out to excommunicate me, but I think most ward members didn't know I had a podcast because they just weren't on the internet and weren't paying attention. Remember, podcasts didn't get big for another seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Like it's 2022 now. Podcasts have really come on in the past five years. Well, I was doing more a podcast 10 years before that. So, so um, you weren't advertising your podcast in your church or anything? No, I was working really hard to... Standard you know, leader. be honest and give honest elders quorum lessons that touched on the issues, but always in the context of faith and not to not not to proselytize my podcast. So, because you were a elders quorum teacher, if I remember, yeah, that. for the first three years, I think of my ward in in, uh, in North Logan. Logan, I was elders quorum instructor. And so, you really weren't a believer, but you were still teaching elders quorum. Well, I thought of myself as a progressive believer, so I wasn't a believer in the one true church. I wasn't a believer that this is exclusive authority. Uh, I didn't believe that, you know, the way I would phrase my belief back then is, I don't know what God is. God, I, I, it's hard to believe that God's anthropomorphic, but there's something, and I'll just call that God. And I don't know if the atonement worked the way that we were taught, but I believe in Jesus' teachings. I, I, I'm a better person when I follow them. Something happened. Was there a resurrection? I'm not sure, but I, I'll, I'm comfortable saying I'm a Christian because I follow the teachings of Jesus. And I had learned enough nuance about Scripture, and I would learned enough about the problems of the Bible to where I knew the Bible had as many historicity problems as the Book of Mormon. So for me, I had redefined Scripture to just be wisdom, myths, 
teachings, moral teachings. And so I could bear testimony that the Book of Mormon was scripture, just like the Bible was scripture, but then I would say Eckhart Tolle is scripture. You know what I mean? So I had a very nuanced testimony. And I even I even could go through the temple recommend questions and um feel good about answering them all in the right ways. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, d did Thomas S. Monson or Gordon B. Hinckley have the keys to lead the church in the restoration? Yeah, something got restored. I don't know exactly what that was, but the current president of the church is the guy who runs the church and the, in that sense has the keys. So like I could, I even got to the point where I could justify answering the temple recommend questions. And I even created a website called stay LDS where I wrote like an 80 page manual in 2007 on how to stay in the church as a nuanced progressive believer. But I still thought of myself as a believer, just, just as a more progressive type, which is, you know, every, Patrick Mason, Spencer Flume, and everybody now who's still a faithful Mormon scholar would probably identify as a progressive Mormon. Oh, plates, who knows? You know, one true church, eh, I'm not big on that, but we have something to contribute. Terrell Givens, Richard Bushman, like that seems to be in vogue today, and that, that's how I felt back then. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. John DeLynn. In our next conversation, we'll talk about how John's approach to church history is different than apologists. And I wasn't a fan of, of finesse. I wasn't a fan of like soft peddling the hard stuff. And that's what apologists, in my view, too often did. If you like what we're doing at Gospel Tangents, please support us. Go to gospeltangents.com and you can get full interviews as well as transcripts if you'd like those. So click here to subscribe and over here you can see some of our other great videos. Thanks again.